Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome you all to this uh, our weekly meeting once again. My name is Daniel. Today we'll be talking about beam standards and the local perspective. And that will be anchored by Dr. Aplai Adamu Aliu, all the way from Leicester City. So I'll just give you a quick background of Dr. Aliu, and I'll hand over the mic to him. So Dr. Aliu is an architectural designer and sustainability consultant with interest in smart cities and smart construction. He has over a decade of experience in the UK architecture and learning and construction industry. He's also a football enthusiast. He has a, a doctorate degree in engineering, civil and architectural engineering from Roborough University, UK. He also has a master's degree of architecture from University of Lincoln, Lincolnshire, UK. He also had his BS, BSc of architecture at Mount Bello University. So, my colleagues, I welcome you to this weekly meeting once again, as we all learn from Dr. Abdu. So, Dr. Abdu, I will hand over the mic to you right now. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Hey. Yeah, um, my sincere apologies for the technical. Which is um, experiencing this. Uh, my name is Dr. Abdullah Yaliu, um, and um, I'm going to present to you uh, um, the local perspectives with regards to BIM and the international standards. Um, so uh, I think we're good to go. Am I am I okay to to, to start? Yeah. Right. Okay. So. Um, a bit about my background, um, I've got an architectural uh, design background. Um, uh, I'm a consultant um, here in the United Kingdom and um, I've got a managerial technical industry and research experience um, in of a couple of uh, things. Uh, and basically I've got a, a degree in architecture which was my bachelor's at Amadebele University in Nigeria. Um, a master's degree from the University of Lincoln and a doctorate in engineering from Loughborough University. So, um, over the last, um, you know, 10 years, and more than 10 years, I've been actually working in the UK, um, and predominantly I've worked with the with this Trade Federation for Precast Concrete Manufacturers, and um, it has to do with, um, you know, anything from, you know, paving blocks to roofing tiles to uh, concrete, um, you know, um, box culverts, architectural cladding, uh, as well as facade engineering. So I actually worked as a sustainable construction researcher. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so basically, the, um, that's that with regards to my background. I think uh, the next bit is to go into the main uh, key discussion of uh, and topic of the day. Um, in terms of the content, um, I just want us to have a, a quick overview, a general overview about what standards are. Um, a, a bit of a, of a background with regards to standards and then focus on um, BIM standards uh, with regards to ISO and a suite of uh, BIM standards that have actually been um, released uh, to, to, the, to the public uh, predominantly by uh, ISO, International Standards Organization. So with regards to that, I, I believe last year um, in December 2018, um, the first two international standards were published by International Organization for Standardization, ISO. And predominantly, the aim was to actually uh, provide a building information model reference, which is ISO 19650. Uh, predominantly, this was followed um, early this year, um, 2019, with uh, ABI, ABS standard, which is ISO 19650 um, one, which predominantly focuses on organization and digitization of information about buildings and civil engineering works, including BIM. Uh, uh, as well as information management using BIM. So that's the first part, which consists of concepts and uh, principles. And then the second part, which is the BSEN ISO 196502, which focuses on the same kind of organization and digitization of information about buildings and civil engineering works, including BIM, uh, but information management using BIM part two, which focuses on the delivery phase of assets. So these two sets of standards it's as an introduction um, and for us to actually um, you know, clear the, the space. 
supersedes any previous standards, uh, which are British standards, uh, predominantly 1192, uh, which was the principles, um, and 1192 part two, which is uh, on capital and delivery phase respectively. So um, a bit of introduction of what are standards. Um, international standards basically uh, are there to actually make things happen, not just predominantly in, in the UK construction industry or the global construction industry, but any facets of human endeavor. It could be the electron electronic industry, it could be the healthcare, agriculture, education, uh, project management, um, and a host of other key areas. The key aspects with regards to standards is to give you the world-class specification to actually make sure that your products and your services and your systems um, have got the right quality, um, they've got the right safety and um, uh, the best and the maximum efficiency and efficacy. There are instruments um, that we use actually to actually uh, make sure that processes, procedures and policies conform to international uh, standards and international trade. Um, so far, there are more than 20,000 international standards and related documents in every sector uh, of the global economy. As I mentioned earlier, from pharmaceuticals, healthcare, technology, food, um, you name it, um, there are international standards. And they have a major impact in everything or, and we do um, as individuals. So certainly, they have got um, a lot of contribution to um, humanity in general. So what is the background with regards to um, these standards and building information modeling? Um, we know uh, within the architecture, engineering, and um, civil uh, engineering industry, um, in, within the UK, BIM standards builds on the guidelines defined by the Worldwide Standards Initiatives, which includes uh, BS 1192-2007, the US National BIM Standards, NBIMS, and the existing as well as proven internal company procedures. These are all aimed at providing a base starting point for in a five BIM standard and, and that can easily be adopted as it and developed and adapted um, for implementation within projects. And they also have specific requirements for structuring of their BIM data. Um, in the UK, of course, um, you know, they, in 2011, the UK government published a BIM working party strategy um, and the, the UK announced the intention to actually uh, require collaborative BIM at 3D uh, with all projects and assets, information, documentation, and data being electronic um, by 2016. So the, the standard recommended for non-graphical information, it's COBE, which is um, Construction Operations Building Information Exchange. This was developed by a number of US public agencies um, to improve the handover process to building owner as well as operators. So a growing number of software packages, as we all know, are now in support of that. And we can actually import and export and exchange data in that format. So I don't have to go into uh, different software vendors um, are available. But this falls in line with industry foundation class and interoperability. Um, we know that for, for being much of the open standards originated from organizations like Building Smart, um, as you can see on the screen, who have actually developed and promoted the adoption of industry foundation class IFC um, and this open system is designed to actually enable interoperability between different property systems, and it can be registered as an international standard. It was registered um, as an ISO 16739. Okay. 2008, it has been actually updated um, lately. We also have another relevant standard, which is ISO 29481 um, and dash one, which was actually published in 2016. So predominantly, uh, if you look at um, the diagram on the right-hand side, um, it provides a holistic diagram on the National Building Information Man Management uh, Modeling Specification uh, by Building Smart. So all these um, standards, as you can see from the pyramid, include terms, uh, processes, as well, as well as data. So if you want to look at uh, that in much detail, then you can um, look at these relevant standards for, um, for that. Can you go to the next slide? It seems I can't uh, control it. Can you can you can you can you control it from your side? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um. Do you want to go back?
Okay. Okay, um, if, with regards to um, IFD, um, for instance, let's take a, a simple example. If, for instance, you have got a window, a single pane window, a panel of window, it has um, certain properties. Um, let's assume in a briefing document on your left hand side, top left, this must have its own fenestrations. Um, and then, you know, it has its own panels and it's made up of glass, for instance. We also have um, this particular window in the product catalog, and this can all be defined as a you know a model in IFD application. So we also have this in the classification system with one property, and then you have the building specification with uh, other properties. So this can all go and fit in into the IFD um, uh, with series of properties, and the host of these properties can then fit into a CAT system. Um, and this CAD system can actually consist of um, a circulation system, a facility management system, and a demolition and reconstruction system. And that can actually be used to be uh, uh, applied by different sectors and then, you know, different uh, organizations. And this can fit into uh, every model. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, this is just a simple example. To, to put this into context, let's assume we are looking at BIM um, from the big picture. We have actually heard from uh, different uh, authors as well as presenters over the last weeks and months with regards to BIM. Um, a simple definition from one of the standards 29481 um, 2016, it's use of a shared digital representation of a built asset to facilitate design construction and operation processes to form a reliable basis for decision. Um, this is timely for us Africans as well as global audience. Uh, infrastructure, it's one of the backbone to any key economy. It could be in the United States, uh, North America, South America. It could be in the Middle East. It could be in Africa, Far East Asia. Predominantly built assets are what we require. I mean, we need schools, we need hospitals, we need um, you know, bridges, we need roads, transportation, rail, air and sea, as well as process plants. So these are our built assets. And the key aspect with regards to this is how do we build them? The idea within the UK, uh, as well as um, global uh, architecture engineering um, you know, industry is how do we provide efficiency um, using building information modeling? Uh, we have all seen uh, the maturity um, you know, model of BIM um, developed by Mark Bill as well as Marvin Richards. So I'm going to uh, you know, use this as a uh, practical example. Can we go to the next slide, please? So looking at um, these maturity levels, they, they, they consist of you know, different formats standards as well as tools. Uh, we know that uh, with regards to BIM levels, we've got levels 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, earliest developments of BIM, you know, started way back uh, with, with the advent of CAD in the early 90s. Um, some could actually trace it back to, you know, uh, you know, the 80s. But generally speaking, in the 90s, drawings are predominantly used, uh, you know, um, using uh, manual drafting methods as well as um, you know um, computer aided design um, and, and drafting so drawings were actually pretty used uh, with that so the standards like bs1192 uh, as well as bs7000 for uh, bs85412 were the key standards that were used for that and you know that digressed into the early 2000s and mid 2000s whereby models objects and collaboration are all done using this key set of standards and then with the advent of bs8 Five, four, one. Um, you know, these was also used in you know drawings, mo models, uh, objects, as well as collaboration, all the way to the early two thousands and ten. So within the last decade or so, uh, we have seen a lot of activity within the BIM you know arena. Um, you know, paper was actually used, uh, files were used, you know, um, files as well as libraries were also used. So we have seen that, um, and I think that is the backbone of um, these kind of um, standards and how they have actually helped in, you know, providing a platform for BIM. So moving that, we're looking into, um, you know, the future uh, between now and then 2020, whereby we can actually use transactable intraoperable data um, using the IFCs, the IDMs, as well as the IFD. So these will actually form and fall in line with the integrated web service, you know, with iCloud and, and iComputing, et cetera, et cetera. And the base starting point for these actually, which is the main aim of the standards, is to actually provide uh, BIM standards that can easily be adopted and adapted for any given projects. So, you know, 
small and medium enterprise, small organizations, small companies, and businesses and individuals who are interested in BIM can actually use this BIM data um, for their projects. Not minding, you know, how small a project could be. It could be a three-bedroom property, four-bedroom property, all the way to a skyscraper, which could be 60 floors, 70 floors, or 80 floors. And this could actually be used for the, in the design of hospitals, you know, in the design of schools, in the design of um, you know, rail stations in the design of um, airports and seaports and harbors etc can we go to the next slide please so um given a, a, a quick overview looking at the uk um uh, uh, within the, the uk um architecture engineering and um, you know uh, construction industry beam standards um, built on guidelines that, are, that have been defined worldwide. Um, as I mentioned, you know, these were all uh, developed by BS 1192, 2007, the, the, the NBS, as well as some other internal systems and organizations. So the UK standards for information management using BIM, can we go to the next slide, please? Which have all been superseded, um, as I, next slide. Yeah, which have all been superseded, which is uh, BS 1192 and, um, you know, public access standards 1192 um, number two are now actually put into two different um, standards, which are um, standards uh, 19650 um, as well as uh, one and two. So these standards would provide more clarity in terms of how organization of information about construction works um, information management using the, you know, uh, BIM uh, would actually be used. So data, information are the key things. So for part one, it focuses on concepts and principles. And then part two focuses on the delivery phase of assets. And then you also have um, the, the, the PD published document 19650-0, which provides guide to B. ES, EN, ISO standards. And these more or less focuses on regions and um, specific countries. And these can actually be used to suit local needs, to suit national needs. And I think that is timely. So for instance, in Africa, if we want to actually apply that, um, it could be in East Africa, it could be West Africa, it could be North Africa or West Africa, we could actually utilize some of these remits. And that's the reason why um, you know, you know, um, the guidance document was published to support in the implementation of, um, you know, these standards, um, uh, you know, locally. So, what is ISO 19650? Um, ISO standards 19650. Um, it's an international standard for managing information over the whole life cycle of a building asset uh, using BIM. So it contains all the same principles and high level requirements as BIM level two, and it's closely aligned with the current UK standards 1192, which has now been superseded. So if you look at the key details of um, the, the concepts and principles, these standards is applicable to the whole life cycle of a building asset. Can we move on to the next few slides, please? Next slide. Maybe, maybe six, 16. Yep, thank you. So these standards is applicable to the whole life cycle of a building assets, uh, which focuses on about 10 key um, stages. So from strategic planning um, to stage two, which is initial design, engineering development, um, documentation and construction, day-to-day -day operation, maintenance, refurbishment, repair, and end of life of the building or the building asset. So if you have an asset, um, it requires substantial amount of investment. Um, and it depends on you know, which country or which region you are from. But let's use uh, the baseline of using $1. Um, and then maybe, for instance, you're investing maybe $500 thousand dollars on, on, on a project it could be a school it could be a hospital so certainly you know it, it requires a lot of planning at the inception or at the conceptualization stage and this involves lots of stakeholders and shareholders in particular for this building asset so if we want to look at it from an objective point of view as a starter i think we need to look at who owns the building so who is the asset owner or who is the client who owns the asset 
that predominantly if we put that into perspective, I think that could give us a bit of more clarity in terms of looking at the big picture of um, asset lifecycle management. So if you've got an investor who has invested his or her money or their money into a, a building asset or a built asset of $500,000, then ultimately, you know, that's a substantial amount of money and it requires a lot of investment. So it could be either maybe from a mortgage bank or from an investment bank or maybe from savings, you know, this can be put together to actually achieve that. So this is a starter. Can we go to the next slide, please? After putting these things into concept, the fact that this standard focuses on concepts and principles, I think it's quite important to look at um, section 3.1 of these particular standards. It has, um, it consists of, um, uh, you know, terms and terminologies, which I think we can actually quickly look at a couple. Uh, the first being responsibility matrix. Um, this gives us an idea of um, a chart that describes the participation by various functions in completing tasks or deliverables. So this could be a number of stakeholders. It could be the you know, um, civil engineer, structural engineer, county surveyor, you know, architects, planners, uh, you know, um, you know, building control officers, and a host of other key you know, professionals, too numerous to mention. And then the next bit, we've got space, which is limited three-dimensional extent defined physically or you know, notionally. Um, we've got the actors. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, in terms of the actors, these are individuals, organizations, um, organizational units, such as departments, agencies, or it could be public or private sector, uh, or a team, which, which are involved in the con construction process um, um, per se. And these organizational units, um, you know, include, but are not limited just to department and teams, as I mentioned earlier, they are individuals that, you know, manage the project, you know, in terms of program and, um, you know, a portfolio of, of, of particular projects. So the whole life cycle of the projects. And you've got numerous individuals, as I mentioned earlier. So in the context of this document, um, in particular, uh, Construction process takes place during the delivery phase and the operational phase. And in most cases, um, the in-use phase, you don't normally have construction works on, apart from refurbishment, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got other key terms like appointment. You know, this includes agreed instructions for the provision of works, goods, and services, the appointed person or appointed party, provider of works, goods, or you know, services, the appointed party, the receiver of works, goods, or service from a lead appointed party. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Then we've got the delivery team, um, um, which includes the lead appointed party and the, the appointed parties. Uh, you've got the task team, um, appointed parties who, as part of their appointment, produce or generate information containers. You've got the asset, which is the item, thing, or entity that has potential or actual value to an organization. Then you've got the project uh, appointment by which a construction work or part of it is executed. Then you've got life cycle, um, which includes the life of the asset from the definition of its requirement to the termination of its use, covering all the key stages um, from the conceptualization to the development, operation, maintenance, support, and the disposal of the asset. Can we go to the next slide? So we also have the KDP or um, key decision point, which includes the point in time during the life cycle uh, uh, when a decision crucial to the direction or you know, viability of the asset is made. So um, there is a note there which provides a bit of more clarity. During a project, this generally aligns with the project stages. So we're going to look at a couple of examples later onwards, but generally speaking, I think these are some of the key important terms. And then other you know, terms which re relates to information management, um, as we all know, BIM is all about data and about data management. So if we interpret data uh, and represent data in a formalized manner, suitable for communication and interpretation and process, then, then that is what we consider information in particular uh, with these uh, relevant standards. Then information can be processed by human or automatic means. You know, we use um, you know, digital technologies we, we compute data using computers, et cetera, and then we plot, you know, drawings and designs, you know, using, um, you know, computers and using software. These all forms part of the data. And then 
if we've got structured and unstructured data, which we are going to look at uh, you know, you know, uh, in the next few slides. So in terms of information requirement, this more or less focuses on specification for what, when, how, and for whom information is to be provided. So you've got you know, um, you know, your Ws, you know, what, when, how, and whom. Then you have the OIR, which is um, organizational information requirements, information requirements in relation to the organizational objectives. You have your AIR, which is directly related to that, which involves the asset information requirement, information requirements in relation to the operation of an asset. And then you have your product project information requirements, which focuses on information requirements in relation to the delivery of an asset. So you have um, you know, uh, issues with regards to um, you know, the pr production, or the creation of the assets, and then you have um, you know the capital delivery, how this asset is been delivered. So these key terms and terminologies all relate to that. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So um, I think I intentionally uh, in uh, you know um, slot in a, a case study at the middle of um, this presentation so that we put into context some of these key terms and terminologies that we've learned or that we've actually re reminded ourselves on. Uh, um, I intentionally uh, put a case study um, about the uh, a Tottenham Hotspur Stadium for the, uh, you know, budding fans or those who watch football, uh, I believe this is essential, but I have to use a disclaimer at the moment. For those of you who are fanatical fans of Arsenal or Chelsea or West Ham or any of the Manchester United, Liverpool, etc., or even the Spanish clubs, um, I'm not a hotspot fan, um, but I am using this to put it into context. Africa has already um, hosted the first World Cup in South Africa, and we are hoping and wishing that Africa is going to, you know, host an Olympic Games at some point. So, you know, this could actually be timely. Um, the, the reason why I chose this case study are multifaceted reasons. One, you know, this stadium, it's one of the you know, newest uh, projects in the, in the UK. Um, potentially, it's going to cost close to a billion pounds by the time it finishes. Um, and I believe it has got, you know, the use of BIM as well as um, the use of technology, digital uh, technology in it. Uh, so we're going to look at that um, uh, in a couple of minutes. The location of this particular stadium, it's in Tottenham um, in London, uh, N17, the postcode. Um, the owner and operator, um, if you look at the standards, we, you know, um, we can use as this to be a client. That's the for a football club. The capacity, seating capacity, it's um, more than 26,000 um, individuals. Um, it is scheduled to open um, in the first quarter of 2019. The construction costs for the stadium, the main ball, um, will cost about um, 350, 350 million uh, pounds to 400 million pounds. The entire project um, is estimated to cost about um, 850 million, but so far we've got um, you know reports that it's going to cross the one billion pounds mark, and it will be termed to be a mega project. The architects, uh, Populous, an American firm, um, they are into uh, the design of um, uh, American football stadiums as well as indoor sports arenas. They have um, you know um, designed and you know supervised the building of more than a hundred of um, such facilities. So they are in, in, in the business big time. Then you've got major contractors, one of the top 10 UK contractors, uh, Maze Construction, who are the contractors. Um, and then can we go to the next slide, please? So you can see some images of um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the stadium. You've got the plan on the right-hand side. And then below that, you've got uh, uh, an image that shows the stadium. So. Um, the planning of this particular stadium, actually, um, the slide be before this, please, 23. Thank you. Yeah, the, the planning permission was actually granted by Haringey Council. Um, initially, they actually um, submitted planning permission um, earlier uh, in the project in around 2010, and that was revised and it was approved by Haringey uh, Council. Um, Predominantly, the planning process has taken more than 10 years, um, you know, from the conceptualization of the idea to uh, 
um, you know, strategic planning um, to, um, you know, um, schematic design to detailed designs, actually. Um, that has actually taken a number of years. The CDM contractors um, are Acadies UK. One of the principal contractors includes McLaren um, Construction in addition to Mace. Uh, you've got subcontractors like Aldris, uh, as well as stadium supply is for the official lighting system to the cable infrastructure installation to scaffolding supply as well as the retractable pitch supply which is one of the key areas of this case study so these are some of the you know um, supply chain uh, or maybe can i say stakeholders in this particular project um, can we go to the next slide please <clears throat> we also have bro uh, engineering um, they also have provided services and some of their key approaches to um, you know um, big designs or big projects like this includes an inspirational design which is at the heart of their operation and particularly what they focus on includes other key aspects of that uh, includes ground engineering inclusive design structural engineering you know energy consulting sustainability infrastructure and also other key things so they are also part of um, you know the, the design and structural engineering team of um, this important project can we go to the next slide please thank you okay so um from available data, publicly available data that um, I've been able to search through, we've been able to look at um, you know, the, the floor plan of this uh, particular stadium. Um, I haven't mentioned this, but this is part of the Northumberland Development Project. And I, you know, as you can see from the main ball of the stadium, apart from the hospitality suites, um, the, you know, the player areas, um, etc. There are dedicated sections for shopping, a hotel, a school, as well as a museum for this particular uh, football club. Um, I cannot actually be able to pinpoint that directly where they are at the moment, but at least um, if you look at the top left-hand side, um, you have areas um, that have been earmarked with dotted lines. Those areas are existing housing developments. Um, they won't stand in the way of the uh, particular this particular development. Um, but if you look at the, the bottom left, you know those you know d dotted lines um, are areas for the new proposed hotel. I think it's going to be a 183 uh, bed um, hotel. On the right, far right, also you've got area for a, a shopping mall. Um, you, you know, one of the chain stores, um, grocery stores. Sainsbury's will actually be built and then you've got areas on the bottom right which includes area for airmark for the um, museum can we go to the next slide please thank you so um, this slide you know it's a cross-section of um, the stadium as you can see um, it pro provides you with a bit of um, you know an information on how the TED system of the stadium will be um, at the top left um, you know where you have um, a purple color it's a sky lounge um, that can directly give you access to um, the pitch for events and uh, football events as well as uh, NFL um, which will be played twice in a year as part of the deal uh, um, and in return, you know, Tottenham will be paid 10 million pounds for that. You've got offices, um, lobby, as well as um, other areas and lounges. You've got restaurants in the pink shaded area. You've got the director's box, which is directly below the restaurant. Um, you've got other, you know, specialty lounges, as well as box for media um, and, um, you know, hospitality purposes. You've got the mix zone and as well as the pitch entrance below which are shaded in brown and then you've got the basement which gives you access to um, you know the vip entry the main entrance which is directly above that as well as the lift shelf which is at the centrally located and if you actually look at this symmetrically the other side the flip of it that gives you the you know the east end of the stadium which consists of a similar arrangement um, below you've got a section that gives you uh, a model that gives us a cross-section uh, and a 3D of the pitch as well as um, how the TED system will look like. Um, on the far right, bottom right, you also have another section, which is not very, very, very clear, but it gives you an idea of the kind of bottle frames, still construction that will be used for the roofing system. If you move on to the next slide, yeah, slide 26, 27, please. 
you would be able to see a bit of more information in terms of the Sky Lounge, the office, um, you know, um, you know uh, the concourse, as well as um, the upper boxes and the upper club, lower club, um, the GA concourse, as well as the club entry and, and, and park parking more or less there is an underground basement parking uh, for that below that is the substructure which includes the you know pile foundation that will that have actually been sunk into that that gives you the support system for the mix zone as well as the third uh, you know uh, stadium concourse on the top right we have a bit of um, a CAD model um, that gives an uh, a view of uh, stadium below that um, it's a photorealistic image um, that has been obtained from the model and then if you move on to the next slide which is um, slide 28 you should be able to see um, the elevations of this masterpiece in my opinion um, it gives you a, an idea of um, the futuristic designs that will be seen in 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 in, in the design of um, stadiums um, globally. The fact that um, not just only Tottenham but other you know um, you know football clubs in, in in the UK as well as um, in other parts of Europe uh, are already looking at the possibilities of um, extending their stadium and expanding that. Um, in in London we have Chelsea, uh, we uh, which are also planning to actually expand theirs, which will also be another one billion pound project or so. Um, we also have Liverpool uh, up north who are also planning to actually you know, expand into the existing facility at Anfield. Um, below, uh, we also have uh, another you know, view of um, the, the stadium, as you can see. Um, that's also another ele elevation. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this also gives you um, another view of um, of the stadium, as well as the new development for the housing, as well as um, the mixed use development there. Um, that is that with regards to this particular stadium. Can we move on to the next bit? Um, as you can see, you you've got um, you know. Um, the main ball of the stadium, you know, having the final touches at the moment, um, it's more or less um, 90, over 95% completed. So I think they're now putting the finishing touches to actually get it completed and ready for test run, etc. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So can, can you play the link? Uh, we've got a two minute video that I would like to show uh, and to put that into perspective. Can you click on the link? No, uh, the, the link below, yes, please. Um, can, you, can you play that? If you can just scroll down a bit, scroll down, scroll down. Yes, please. Can you click on the stadium stories sliding picture update? Thank you. So um, I want us to, to look at this uh, um, you know, particular short video. I think it will give us a, a, a general view. It's the first retractable you know, pitch in the United Kingdom um, that ha has two pitches. So if you click on the video and then potentially we could see, watch the video and... Um, And you click on the audio so that we can listen to that. I can't hear the audio. Can you hear it? Okay. 
can you hear the audio? It seems it's freezing from my end. I don't know um, whether you are also experiencing the same thing. Okay. Well, I think a suggestion was made that um, the link should be shared on. Uh, I think we can we can look at that. Can you can you share the link so that you know all participants within the group chat can actually access that? Can, can you can you do that, please, Moses? Moses, I, I think there, there is some technical glitch that we're exper experiencing. Can you can you respond to this if you can hear me? Yes, I can. So okay. the link has been sent to the uh, chat box. Okay. Anybody can type uh, can select. Okay. Okay, so um, predominantly, I think that we can continue then if, because I cannot control it from my, you know, due to the technical hitches I'm having. Thank you, I can see that the link is there. So can, can we, can we um, proceed from that? So can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, um, then uh, more or less, these are some other images that you can actually see you, um, and you can actually get them from the interview with regards to this particular interesting stadium. So the, the lesson here is if, for instance, we want to design a stadium of this capacity, for instance, for Africa, maybe in the future for the Olympics, et cetera, um, any, of the host any of the host countries could actually have some lessons to learn as we, uh, as well as us, all of us who are built environments, um, you know, um, students, and we can actually learn from this. So if we go on to the next slide, which is slide 36, uh, I want us to look at the second part of the, the national standards, ISO 19650, um, which focuses on um, delivery phase of an asset. Um, and as I had mentioned, to put this into context, um, I've given the first example, let's assume we have a, uh, a, a construction project which cost $500,000. Or maybe in this particular case, we have got a stadium for the Tottenham, which costs more than a billion pounds um, at the minute. You, you can actually look at the delivery phase of this particular asset. And some of the key things that you need to focus on is, can we move on to the next bit, next slide? Is we can look at, um, from the standards, um, there is a diagram that focuses on three key issues organizational management, um, asset and project management, and then information management. At the heart of every BIM project, and for us to actually you know, achieve BIM, we have to integrate these three things. And predominantly, we've got three key stages to, the, to do that. For you to actually have an asset information model, as well as um, you know, uh, project information model, you need to start at the delivery phase. So once you know the handover of all the relevant information, information from the AIM to the PIM have, have been actually successfully done, then we need to progress to the second bit. As you can see, there is a clockwise um, circle, which which uh, which consists of um, some 
triangles or arrows that connects A to B. Um, section B focuses on the progression, the progressive development of the design intent model into the visual construction model. And then stage C focuses on the end of delivery phase, which is more or less handing back of the relevant information from the PIM to the AIM. So these organizational management, um, you know, uh, system also falls in line with uh, ISO 19001, um, you know, quality, um, uh, you know, management standards. It also focuses on um, you know, um, the asset management standards, 5,000, um, as well as um, ISO 21500, which is the project management standards. So as you can see, all these can actually be used to actually um, achieve, you know, aim as well as pin so asset information model and you know project information model in the starting phase of a project as well as the progression and the end delivery phase of the project so can we go to the next bit if you look at the next slide it also focuses on the interfaces between the different parties and teams um, for the purpose of information management uh, at the beginning of this pre presentation we looked at the different um, stakeholders from the architects the designers and all the key stakeholders um, that have particular stake in a project. In this particular project that we've looked at, the case study, you know, I've mentioned uh, the number of clients that we have, the clients which are Tottenham Stadium, um, you know, the football club by itself. Uh, you've got the key, you know, individuals, the appointing party, which is A, this could be the, you know, the, the client. Then you've got uh, B, which is the lead appointed party, you know, C, appointed party. And then, you know, you've got the project team, which is the one, Project team, um, and then you've got number two, illustration of the delivery team, and then number three, which is the task team. You can see a nucleus there of different arrows and circles. At the heart of this particular, you know, bubbles that we have or circles, you know, you've got the appointing party, which is the client. The client, more or less, is you know, is the starting point of everything. All the key decision making processes will be taken by the client, and then you know that will feed into B which is the lead appointing party, or maybe the contractor in this case. Uh, and then you've got the C, which could be, um, you know, subcontractors, et cetera. And you have numbers one, two, three, which all these sit in with the project team. The project team, which are all the professionals, will determine how the project will go, will go, will go ahead in terms of the design phase of the project, in terms of um, the construction design, in terms of the electrical, mechanical, structural, uh, you know, uh, you know, building services as well as um, you know, uh, the landscaping of the project. So these are all some of the key professionals that will be mandated with this task. Then you've got arrows, which gives you idea on information exchange and data exchange. These information requirements and information exchanges are all being coordinated by these professionals. The one that has got the bold line includes information requirement and you know, information exchange is a two-way arrow. So you can see arrows with two ends. And then the second arrow, um, you know, bottom left, bottom right, consists of the information coordination arrow. And this gives you an idea of how information is being exchanged between these professionals. Um, can we go to the next bit? Um, the next slide focuses on information management um, process and how you can actually achieve that during the delivery phase of the asset. You've got series of activities and series of nodes, um, as well as, um, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, squares in the middle, which have been chamfered by the edges. Each of these are uh, activities. You've got activity one, two, three, four, five, all the way to eight. This series of activities are part of the construction process. And then on the bottom right, you have got, um, you know, series of alphabets, A to F, which gives you the information and the activities, as well as which project and the appointment on who appoints what. So if we look at the first, um, you know, um, square you've got assessment and need in most instances for you know you need to have a business case for a project why do you need to have the project is what are the aims of the project what's the purpose of the project what do you want to achieve these assessment of the needs and the ones are the at the center of it so in the case of the stadium at, uh, you know Tottenham stadium wanted to actually expand you know the experience you know the fun fans experience so they want to actually have a, you know a stadium with the best world class facilities as well as you know to, to to host other you know key events at the heart of london as well as um, you know um, you know provide you know venue uh, and you know regenerate the area uh, which is in the northern part of london so the assessment and the need is part of that planning process of the project the next bit once all this has been done 
you need to look at the invitation to tender. So this focuses on construction management and the areas of procurement really. Um, and then, you know, you invite to tender, you can actually go for any of the processes, open tender, closed tender, or selected, selected tender. The next bit involves, you know, tender response. Once you actually invite individuals to actually bid for the project, you know, you open the bid and then you select and you appoint at stage four. Then you mobilize to construction, uh, to the construction site. Once you know the appointment has been made at stage four, you mobilize on site. You know, men, women, as well as construction equipment. You know, heavy equipment are brought onto the site. Your cranes, you know, your your trucks. You know, um, you know, uh, and all logistics on the supply chain will be managed. Then you've got the collaborative production of information. And this will be exchanged between these key stakeholders, um, the construction stakeholders, and then you've got the information model delivery. Uh, which includes the use of building information models um, and modeling throughout the phase. So from, um, you, know, um, you know, 2D to 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D, all the way to, you know, uh, 11 or 14D, dependent on which level one is. And then you move on to the final bit, which is the project closeout phase, which is the end of delivery phase of the project. And to put this into context, um, the Tottenham Stadium is at this stage, is at the end of the delivery phase, based on the fact that the project is at the closeout stage. So you've got, um, you know, A, B, C, D, E, and F, which are all dot in dotted lines. Um, this includes the information model progression from the subsequent delivery teams to each of the appointments. And then you've got B, which focuses on activities undertaken by a project. And then you've got C, D, E, and F. These are different activities which have been undertaken from the appointment to the procurement stage, to the information planning, and then finally to the production stage of each of the appointments. And that culminates the end of this particular delivery of this asset. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Can we go to the next slide? Okay, um, in this particular slide, we've got the construction project end of life cycle activities. Um, you know, it's similar to the earlier slide that we've seen, but these, um, you know, uh, slide shows activities that can work hand in hand or concurrently. So you've got this, you know, the starting phase, which is, you know, depicted or represented by the first circle, which fits into, um, you know, um, the key 1.1 appointment of individuals to undertake the information management function. And this could be your engineers, your quantity surveyors. You know, it also includes, you know, um, you know, all the key professionals that, you know, forms part of the construction and project management team. And then you move on to the next bit, which includes uh, 1.2 and 1.3. This includes the establishment of projects information requirement, as well as the delivery milestones. So what do you want to achieve from the substructural work to the structural work as well as the superstructure so if you want to have your foundations how are you going to go about that if you want to have you know you know the the frame of the building how do you want to erect that the, you know and if you want to have the roofing system also how do you do that so things like that how do you deliver that at each key assessment point you can actually you know try to see whether you've actually hit your milestone or not then you've got the information standard the production methods and the procedures, as well as the reference information and shared resources. So the common data environment, CDE, as well as the information protocol. And finally, you know, you have the information model progressing, progressing from one stage to the other, which has been handled by the delivery team at each key appointment when it's been made. So can we move on to the stages of maturity of analog um, information? Can we move to the next stage? So um, this gives us the different strata um, of, um, you know, um, analog to um, the migration to digital information management. And this particular standard focuses on some of the key tangibles, um, you know, for instance, the structured data that you have, your building information model, um, and, um, you know, key other factors that you have that includes um, um, not just the model by itself, but the components and, and, and that goes into the model. Then you have unstructured data, for instance, soil samples, or maybe, um, you know, any social issues that, you know, require, you know, community consultation, or maybe uh, participatory design issues, etc. These are unstructured data that can also form part of the information, you know, federated information models. So that is the information bit. Apart from the business case, which is the business layer, which includes increasing the benefit from existing and new digitally supported and enabled processes, you also have the information layer, which has, you know, the BIM objects, uh, you know, based information from server information models, as well as federated information models, and then your structured data, and then, you know, your big data. And then 
Below that, you have you know um, the technology tier, which includes you know querying of models, um, clash detection model, container, database, common set data environment, uh, and then you have the process standards which are being developed, which in part are these particular standards. Um, the first part which have actually we've actually looked at um, the key concepts and principles. And the second part, which focuses on um, you know um, the delivery stage, so these are the particular standards that are actually being um, published by uh, ISO. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So um, the fact that I think we you know my uh, we have an hour, but I think uh, I will have. A couple of more slides to go. Maybe we have to, you know, flick through some of these slides. Um, uh, this particular slide focuses on information management perspectives. It gives you an idea in terms of perspective, the purpose as well as example for deliverables. So I'm not going into this in, in detail, but it gives you the perspective view of the asset owner, as well as the perspective of the user, and then the you know the project delivery or asset management perspective, and finally, the societal perspective. And that's one of the key areas or key aspects of information management, how every stakeholder is kept abreast with what is happening in terms of the, the construction process of particular assets. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So we have the hierarchy of information requirements. Um, this gives you, um, you know, key information with regards to all interested parties and the information they require from the organizational perspective and the project perspective. So the organizational information requirements are, you know, contributes to and the project, you know, information requirements PIR, and this all contributes to the next bit, which is the appointment information. Uh, when you actually appoint a contractor to you know handle a particular project then ultimately this particular contractor needs the asset information requirements and these will be exchanged um, using the ER and then that also fits into the aim which is um, the asset information model um, and the project information model and these are all information deliverables which are used in the construction phase as well as the post construction so potentially this would help in the management of the Asset post construction, and in the case of the Tottenham Stadium, which was the case that we looked at, this will be handed over to the facility managers or the client, and they will be able to use this whenever they want to actually maintain, um, you know, the facility or the asset. Um, it could be reactive maintenance, it could be plan maintenance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Can we move on to the next slide? This will focus on the generic project and asset information management lifecycle. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we've looked at this. Can we look at the next one? Um, so this focuses on generic specification and planning for, for information delivery. Um, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, BIM is all about data and information management. Um, apart from the use of you know digitization and digital technologies, we also need to look at you know the data. You know how do you actually process it? So information requirements in most instances, whenever you have a client he or she or them in particular would state exactly what they want. In this case of the stadium um, that I'm linking as part of the case study, it's they want to have an increased seater capacity of more than 60,000 you know, um, seats. So that is some of the things they want. They want to have a mixed use development which consists of a stadium, hospitality, houses, um, as well as um, you know, shopping a mall, which will go in line with that. So the information delivery planning, how do you plan uh, and when do you Deliver it. So you need to give time skills. You need to actually have you know a timeline of the project to be procured, to be you know constructed, and then to be you know handed over and open uh, as a You also have the information delivery. Who is going to deliver that, and what is the medium of the delivery, and is there going to be any information approved? Yes. If it's been approved, then what are the feedback system that you're going to have? So these all all falls in line with the information delivery and how this information has been exchanged. And you know, the good aspect with regards to this is you can actually link this particular area with other standards, which include asset management standards, quality management standards, as well as um, ISO 19650 itself. So these all falls in line with the organizational management, the asset and project management, and the information management. The next slide gives us an illustration of the subdivisions of the processes in terms of the project and you know the appointment that's been made, as well as all the activities that, that have been undertaken in the procurement stage, you know, the planning stage, as well as the production stage. Um, and these falls in line with the relationships with the key decision-making process and the information of the lead party. So can we move on to the next slide? 
Thank you. Yeah, so this slide gives an idea of the appointing party, which is the client and the key decisions they make at different stages. So the end stage is the project organizational information requirements. And this goes into the project with all these key requirements and then our information exchanges between the respective stakeholders holders up and down the chain. So once this information is exchanged and you know models are being viewed and models are being used um, you know, in, in, on construction sites, information deliverables are then achieved. And then from the you know, st stage one, you go to stage two, all the way to the last stage of the construction process. And these ex information cascades and it goes up and down the, you know, um, um, you know, within the different respective stakeholders. Then the lead appointed party, the same thing happens. You know, this kind of information moves forward up and down the chain. And then the appointed party, appointed parties will use this to collaborate as part of um, the information uh, to be used and decisions are being made. Next slide, please. So along the way, you also need to check the information that's been you know, provided um, during an information exchange. Um, this information must be valid, it must be reliant, it must be reliable and coherent. At the same time, you know, it must be the accurate information that's been provided. You know? So you know, these stages um, you know, includes the end of stage review uh, one and then the end of stage review N plus one. And these all parties, the appointing party as well as the lead party, you all collaborate to make sure that this you know, particular stage of information exchange is seamless. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So um, this particular slide um, is an example of the information being provided by the whole delivery team. So from the architects to the plan, planners to the engineers um, and, and all the key stakeholders, um, the lead appointed party at stage one, you know, more or less, that's the delivery phase of the leadership. According to any project procurement, this timings and decides who will be the contractor. So this fits into stage one, two, um, as well as other key stages in between. Within these spaces, all the information exchange with the appointed party, which is the main client, are actually being done, you know, pre-operational stage. So it includes strategic definition, you know, stage all the way to the construction construction phase. So that is the you know, section that this focuses on. And then you know, you've got the next bit, which is the operational phase, which includes um, you know, the phase of the operation of the building. So once the building has, been, it has come to life and it can be used, then you can actually be able to make use of this information in the, you know, uh, the operation of the building. So the lead appointed party is X, and then you know, you've got the lead appointed party Y, these guys come together. Lead appointed party X, in most instances, is who is the client. And then lead appointed Y is the contractor. And then, you know, you've got the lead appointed party Z, potentially that could be the facility manager or estate manager. And these all have other individuals or stakeholders that helps them to actually make sure that the process and procedure is seamless. So in, for the case of the lead appointed party X, which is the client, and in this case, we're talking about Tottenham, for instance, you know, they also have you know, other key professionals that would help them to make informed and educated decisions in terms of the procurement of the building. And then for the lead appointed party Y, you've got, you know, sub, you know subcontractors, you know, in the case of, uh, you know, these, we're talking about MACE, which are the main con construction contractors, as well as some other subcontractors they've appointed, uh, uh, for instance, Arcadis. And then for the facility management, you could have, you know, other companies and stakeholders that would help in the facility management or asset management of the asset uh, throughout this life cycle. Thank you. I want to the next bit. So um, the next slide also gives you an information in terms of the transfer of the asset information management and project information management between the respective stakeholders. So as you can see, all the you know diamond which is in, in, in highlighted in red is for the asset owner or the project client, which makes the key decision making points. And then you have other key important aspects of the information exchanges which have been highlighted in green uh, within the delivery team into the PIM, PIM as well as um, the AIM. Can we go to the next slide? So in terms of the common data environment concept, um, the fact that we're talking about information exchange and information management, You've got shared information which has been approved by the different you know, teams uh, as well as the delivery team. This has been reviewed, approved, checked, 
um, and then you know once this has been done, then you know um, the work in progress has been done by the different tax teams. So information has been developed by its originator or tax team, not visible or accessible by anyone else. And this could be maybe the you know uh, the architects, or maybe uh, the second team could be the you know civil engineers or the structural engineers, and, and another task team could be the facade engineers, or maybe another task team could be the landscape architects, for instance or maybe you could get the continuous surveyors or maybe uh, building services engineers or electrical engineers. These could be different task teams and they fit in to provide a shared format of you know, a common data environment that can be used by everyone. This can be reviewed, checked, um, and then published. And once this is published, this information can be referred to as authorized for use. This includes all the details construction drawings, you know, the detailed design, as well as the, you know, key information in terms of maintenance of the artists and the management of it. And these can later on would be fit into an archive or a library that can store the, this information. And this can be considered to be the journal of information in which inc includes all the transactions and providing an audit trail of information container development. So, you know, post construction of the Tottenham stadium in the next 20 years for instance if they want to actually check anything or in the next two years if they want to check anything with regards to the electrical systems they can actually be able to you know pull this from the shelf pull it from the archive electronic archive and be able to see this information so for instance who are the suppliers of the floodlights who are the suppliers of maybe the retractable uh um, you know pitch and if for instance you want to actually change anything you've got the dimensions you've got the information and that can actually be used can we move on to the next slide please Um, with regards to the relationship of the, this particular standards, um, uh, ISO 19650, with other key standards, as I mentioned earlier, we've looked at a couple of these standards and how they relate to this. Um, both part one and part two of these standards have been developed to work in alignment with existing business management systems. So you've got the energy management systems, for instance. You've got the you know um, uh, quality management systems. Uh, you've got the asset management systems, which all falls in line with international standards. And these would actually help to to, to have a seamless uh, you know um, you know product or a seamless you know asset. This particular representation, um, as you can see in the figure, gives us the structure of um, you know the international standards. And this focuses on the plan and do act. Um, of um, you know ISO one uh, ISO 9001, which is the quality management standards. To start with, if for instance you want to look at the planning system, um, in most instances, whenever you have a piece of asset or an asset or built asset, you must have customer requirements, and this particular customer or maybe the client would provide the information he or she needs or them, and this would go into the planning system. And then you plan that, and then it moves into the support system. At the heart of that, you've got the leadership. They control how everything goes around. It's more or less a, you know, a cycler and um, an anti-clockwise direction. So you plan, you do the work in terms of the construction, and then you check, um, you make sure that everything is according to plan, and then you act. And finally, you, know, you can actually transfer this particular asset to the asset owner who maintains the asset throughout its life cycle. We also have another standards, which is ISO 29481. Can we move on to the next slide, please? This particular asset, uh, this particular standards um, focuses on um, the methodology of the business processes. Um, this more or less falls for the management uh, of, of, of the built assets and the facility management. Uh, it gives you, um, you know, a process map and all the information that you need to actually to maintain the construction work. It also helps in terms of the interoperability uh, the exchange of information uh, between software applications at the construction phase uh, and the end of life phase of the building. So it includes, for instance, the construction works, the briefing, the design documentation, operations, as well as some digital collaboration between the different actors and stakeholders. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so to put this into perspective, um, I want to use the RIBA plan of work, um, and it gives you the key different stages of um, construction activity. Um, this is uh, pulled from the Royal Institute of British Architects. Um, you've got st stages zero to seven, um, strategic definition, the preparation of the brief, the concept design. So to put this into context, if let's say we're looking at uh, the 
Tottenham Stadium. At some point, this stadium must have you know, covered all these key stages. So strategic definition, preparation of the brief, concept design, develop design, technical design, and then the construction, which is stage five. At the moment, this is where we are at the moment for this particular project. Um, and the next stage will be the handover and the closeout phase, potentially in, within this first quarter of 2019. And the in-use phase is when the facility or the asset has actually been used or put into operation. So we're going to focus on this. So to put this into context, I want us to, I want to remind us of that, um, you know, uh, um, you know, out, you know, outline uh, of work with the beam overlay. Can we move on to the next slide? Yeah. So at each of these key important stages, stages A and B uh, of the RIB plan of work um, includes the preparation stage and some of the key beam activities that we have to focus on includes maybe um, client advisory. What are the purpose? Uh, what's the main purpose of this? Basically, the benefit behind this is to actually agree on the extent of beam, beam involvement. So, for instance, are we going to st uh, you know stand at beam level you know two, or are we going to look at the beam level three? So, does it include all the key stages of beam two, two D, three D, four D, five D, six D? But in particular, we are focusing on time, four D. 5D, which is cost, and then 6D, which is uh, you know facility management. And then what are the long-term ambitions and the long-term responsibilities by the owner of the model? What are the you know the key inputs in terms and outputs for the post-occupancy of the building? So these are some of the key aspects of the appraisal. And then you know the facility management at the end of life of the at the, at the post-construction stage, how the building is going to be managed or the asset is going to be managed. Stage B focuses on the design brief the project sustainability aspirations, as well as, you know, what are the key definitions of responsibility? Then we've got stage C, which focuses on concepts and design development. Now, how do we actually set up, um, you know, uh, uh, the BIM meetings? How do we uh, look, agree on the, the common data, you know, formats? How do we agree on the environmental performance of the building? And how do we actually enable, you know, the design team to have access, uh, access to the, you know, BIM data? And then finally, how do you share that? This focuses on the design development at um, stage D. How do you share the, you know, this data? How do you integrate it? And then how do you actually you know, provide bespoke design and components for the particular project? Can we go to the next slide? Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So then we have stages, um, you know, C, D, and E, which includes the concept design development um, and you know, technical design stage. These also, you know, includes, uh, you know, um, the key aspect of, you know, environmental performance, you know, uh, analysis, you know, 4D, 5D assessment. Um, and then you've got stages F, G, and H, which is the pre-construction. Next slide, please. Uh, at the pre-construction st uh, stage, you need to export, you know, um, you know, building control analysis, and then as well as planning permission, extra, you know, extract this data, share this data with, you know, um, design coordinators. And then, you know, produce, you know, uh, parametric level objects, um, you know, uh, as well as elements. Uh, and then embed this into the specification to the model. And then finally, you know, you can review the construction sequence uh, um, 4D with, with the contractor. And, you know, all these uh, procurement, you know, stages have been completed. Can we go to the next slide, please? We're nearly there. Um, sorry. I have to take your, more of your time, but uh, I think we... We should be rounding up um, in the next, you know, four slides or so. Thank you for your patience. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the the, the next slide focuses on BIM uses. Um, mapped over time. Um, this was extracted from one of the presentations by Tona and Tona. Um, it focuses on all the RIB key stages, stages zero to stage seven. And if you look at all these key stages, um, you know, they, are, they have, you know, significance in terms of importance um, to, to the projects that we're looking at. So let's look at the Tottenham um, you know, case as, as, as an example. They've developed the appraisal. They've looked at the existing conditions of the site as well as the, you know, the existing and prevailing circumstances. 
instances of the model. They've done their cost sensor, their estimation, uh, cost control. All these are achievable. They are actually put in green. As, as you can see, the horizontal lines, they all go in green. We can achieve this. We can design using BIM, uh, you know, we can also, all these, we can actually have bespoke building objects. All these can actually be done. We can carry out an objective, you know, um, energy analysis. We can actually go on to the next stage, which includes record modeling, construction system, fabrication, and then all the way to the building systems and analysis. So what are the things that we can achieve and what are the things that are, are challenging? But at the same time, we can achieve them. And then what are the unachievable? Can we go to the next slide? So at the inception, um, which is at stage one and zero, um, you know, the strategic definition stage as well as the preparation um, or, and brief stage, developmental appraisal can become unachievable. Special plan and optimization and set analysis can become you know, unachievable without planning permission. You can actually be able to carry out all or some of these things. You can actually carry out the transport analysis. You can actually carry out you know, um, you know, other key aspects that you require. So ultimately, we need to have planning permissions for us to be able to move on to the next stage. So this is something that you can, if you cannot achieve this, you can actually move on to the next stage. So can we go to the next stage, please? So we've looked at stages zero and stages one. So we're going to look at stages two, three um, uh, in, in context. So developmental appraisal, you can achieve that. You can achieve, sorry, you need to go to the back and the slide before this. So if you cannot achieve the first two sections of this particular um, you know, um, strategic definition and um, preparation and brief, this will have an impact on late decisions. So if you can't achieve this, what are the achievable? The achievable could be cost estimation, cost sequencing and simulation, the designing, the drawing generations, et cetera, et cetera. All these can actually be done without planning permission. So without approval, you can't actually be able to estimate how much the building is going to cost you, uh, what type of design are you going to have, what's going to be the extent of this design in terms of the scope, some of these key project management constraints in terms of time, in terms of cost, in terms of quality and scope can all be identified. And then these can all be termed as achievable and all the way to construction system design, the fabrication, you know, uh, field management tracking, possession and permit to work, these can all be achieved. And once you get the permit, that's when you can actually continue with the construction fees, which is the next stage, stage five, six, and seven. Can we look at that, please? Thank you. So if we look at these in the context of the big picture, um, you know, you have multifaceted stakeholders and shareholders in particular in this particular project. So we, how does this help us in Africa, for instance? You know, how do we look, look at this? Some of the key things to, to look at includes organizational and strategic planning. Uh, you need to look at and understand your customers as a professional of the built environment. If you're an architect or you're a planner or you know, you're a country surveyor or maybe an engineer, civil, electrical, mechanical, or maybe a building services engineer, a landscape architect, or, and, you know, or an important stakeholder or a manager in, in the construction industry. You need to look at your stakeholders, understand who are your stakeholders, who are your customers, what are the existing legislations within the, the, the region that you're working on. If you're working in South Africa or East Africa or West Africa, what are the existing legislations? Do you have you know, a sub-regional legislation? If you don't have, then you need to look at it from a country level. The country that you live in, are you in Kenya or are you in Egypt or you're in Algeria or in Nigeria or Ghana or Senegal or South Africa or Namibia or Mozambique? What are the key legislations within in your particular country? Who are you going to you know, discuss the investment opportunities with? For you to have a built asset, you need to have investors. If you're going to have a project of magnitude, a large scale magnitude, in Africa, we have a population of over a billion people. How do we provide the infrastructure required to, you know, to kickstart the African economy? So for us to look at that, we need to look at investment options, infrastructure investment. We need to look at the banks, the mortgage banks, you know, the investment banks, and, and, and you know, um, other banks that actually can actually foot the bills to build railway, to actually build the schools, the hospitals hospitals, the health centers, the social facilities, and basic amenities. I mean, you also need to look at the commercial environment. Is it a viable you know, uh, option to have that? You know, if, for instance, you want to build a stadium after the games or maybe after the Olympics, what kind of impact is it going to have to the local community? 
uh, is it going to be a white elephant project or are you going to uh, use it for multifaceted activities? You know? And then these all forms into the organizational strategic plan. Um, and this is actually the next bit. You need to look at you know, the organization and the people and the enablers who are going to make this to work. And this, in the big scheme of things, forms part of the scope of the asset management. You can't have an individual investing $500 million or 1 billion pounds, uh, maybe for a, a real project or maybe for an energy project or transportation or internet. And then this is not being you know, utilized or this is not you know, looked at from a holistic perspective in terms of the whole life value and whole life management life cycle. So the asset management strategy planning needs to go into that. Asset management and decision making needs to go into that. Asset knowledge and enablers needs to go into that. And individuals, uh, captains of industry, educators, you know, students of uh, BIM, you know, students of the built environment, and all stakeholders would have to fit into this. And this actually kicks into the key professionals and experts that provide these assets. The cycle that that's at the heart of that is more or less about the asset life cycle delivery. You need to acquire the property in the, in the case of the stadium that we'll be looking at as, a, as, a, as an example. Once you acquire that, you operate it. Once you operate it, you maintain it. And once you maintain it, you dispose it. The asset life cycle value, this could be the you know, 60 to 80 years or maybe more than, more than that. And certainly there will be risks attached there could be review as well. To round up the, the, the session, if you look at this from a big picture, you should be able to be in an educated and an knowledgeable standpoint. And certainly that would actually give you the impetus and the requirement to look at this um, for the future for any built asset in whichever sector of the economy you're focusing on in, in the African continent and sub-regions that we have. Um, can we go to the final slide? Um, the, the final slide, or, or basically, it's just a summary. We've been able to look at um, a number of standards, uh, standards that um, have been superseded. Um, the BS 1192, um, uh, as well as um, the, the newest standards, which are the 19650, 1 and 2. Some are in the pipeline. We've got you know, 4 and 4. Five in the pipeline. Uh, we've been able to look at this from a life cycle angle. We've been able to put this into the context of a UK custody. And then finally, in terms of um, the conclusion of the presentation, I was able to actually give you some key, you know, had, you know, data that can actually give us uh, a bit of food for, for thought for the African subcontinent. So thank you very much once more. Um, I'm sorry it has taken more than an hour. Um, I'm more than happy to answer your questions, and I would like to use this opportunity to, to thank um, BIM Africa for this global project. A couple of references for you if you want to actually have a look. Thank you very much once more. So thank you, Dr. Blay, for the wonderful and detailed session. So please, uh, I don't know if any of us have any questions. Like I mentioned earlier, you can just type your question into the chat box as we are already short of time. Yeah, we are. Thank you. So please, if you have any questions, just type it into the chat box. Okay, it seems I have no question. Okay. okay. Um, in the absence of any questions, um, thank you very much for your time, your patience, and your attention. And um, I hope this will be uh, something worthwhile for all of us. And uh, we should take that conversation and discuss next. Okay. Thank you very much. Africa. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>